Hello, my name is Eliseu, and in this video I'm going to talk about network motifs. In a given network, motifs are recurring patterns that occur significantly more often than what would be expected at random. Beyond their structural characteristics, motifs are potentially associated with specific functions in the network. For this reason, they are objects of special interest in network science, especially in biological networks. To understand this better, let's start simple. Here's a small section of a large directed network. Here's another section of the same network, and here's another one. They certainly look different, but do you see something in common? Yes, these highlighted patterns are present in all three of them. In fact, they appear 42 times at different locations in the network. For a network of this size, we would not expect it to happen more than 10 times. Thus, we found a motif. Later on, I will explain how we can find more of them, such as these three that you see on the screen right now. But before that, let's go back to what I said in the beginning. We just verified that our first motif satisfies the first property. But what about the second one? Is this functional motif? To determine whether these motifs play any special roles in the network, we need to know what the network is doing. In this case, it turns out that this is a very special regulation network. It controls the gene expression in the bacteria of the species Escherichia coli. During the process of transcribing genetic information from DNA to messenger RNA, special proteins called transcription factors can regulate whether groups of genes will be transcribed or not, so they are expressed at the right time and right amount throughout the life of the cell. They are called either activator or repressor transcription factors. Here's a diagram to help you understand better. The purple protein is called RNA polymerase, and it's responsible for binding to the DNA and transcribing the genes. A repressor can prevent it from doing its job, while an activator can help. The transcription network can be represented as a directed graph, in which each node represents a group of genes called an operon, and edges represent direct transcriptional interactions. Each edge is directed from an operon that encodes a transcription factor to an operon that is regulated by that transcription factor. Moreover, it can be either positive or negative. An operon that encodes a transcription factor refers to a group of contiguous genes that, when transcribed, produce a transcription factor protein. Now that we know what the network is doing, we can try to analyze our first motif in terms of its function. This motif is usually called a feed-forward loop. The transcription factor X regulates Y, which in turn regulates Z. At the same time, X regulates Z directly. When they are disposed like this, we call X the general transcription factor, Y the specific transcription factor, and Z the factor operon. If the direct effect of the general transcription factor on the effector operon is at the same sign, negative or positive, as its net indirect effect to the specific transcription factor, we call this motif coherent. In this network, 85% of the motifs with this shape are coherent. To get a clue of what this motif might be doing, Let's consider its dynamic features. In particular, assume that Y needs X to be active for some time before it's activated, and that Z needs both X and Y to be active. In this situation, Z acts analogously to an end gate in computation. This is what happens when we send a short pulse as an input to X. We see that Y does not have enough time to reach the threshold value of a 0.5, so Z never gets activated. Let's repeat the experiment one more time. However, let's try sending a longer pulse as well. Now, Y has enough time to activate, so Z activates as well. However, as soon as X turns off, Z responds immediately. If we did not have the direct connection from X to Z, this would take a longer time. Feedforward loops occur where an external signal causes a rapid response of many systems such as the repression of sugar utilization systems in response to a drop in glucose levels. In the case of Scherichia coli, we find them controlling the breakdown of another type of sugar called arabinose. This completes the first part of our discussion on motifs. We could do a similar analysis with the second and third motifs that we saw earlier. However, I promised to talk a little bit more about how to find motifs. Although they might be a little different sometimes, most of the algorithms follow a very simple strategy. The tricky part is in how you implement each of the steps of this strategy. First of all, you have to choose what motif size to look for. Then, you are likely going to need to know what are all possible subgraphs of that size. 
Then it's a matter of counting. For each of these subgraphs, what is their frequency in the target network versus in the random network? Finally, by comparing the two using z-score or p-value, we can decide whether a motif candidate is significant or not. In this video, we will quickly explore the mFinder algorithm, one of the first motif finding tools. mFinder is based on random sampling of subgraphs, which means it does not exhaustively search for all possible occurrences of a motif in a network. Instead, it estimates its significance based on a smaller number of samples and in the probability of sampling specific subgraphs in the network. This is useful for large datasets. The random sampling works by picking a random edge from the network and then expanding the subgraph iteratively by picking random neighboring edges until the subgraph reaches n nodes. For each random choice of an edge, in order to pick an edge that will expand the subgraph size by 1, we prepare a list of all such candidates' edges and then randomly choose an edge from the list. Finally, the sampled subgraph is defined by the set of n nodes and all the edges that connect between these nodes in the original network, not just the edges that were picked by the expansion process. In the screen right now, we have a simple example for three nodes, where we first pick the edge going from 2 to 1 with probability 1 fourth. Then we pick the edge going from 2 to 3 with probability 1 half. The final graph does not need any additional edges or nodes. After this process is done many times, and probabilities are correctly taken into account, mFinder can obtain a reasonable estimate for the concentration of motives in a large network. Then it calculates z-scores for each subgraph type, and that's it. We are done. Here's a table from the original mFinder paper outlining some of the results. I hope this video has been a helpful introduction to the theory and applications of network motifs, and I hope that it made you curious to learn more about network science. I'll leave some references in the description of this video. Thank you very much for watching.